This FedGov Today program is sponsored by Rancher Government Solutions. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, a theoretical shift becomes reality at the Patent and Trademark Office. Two big factors in your agency's cloud journey and a new TMF investment at the Labor Department. Welcome to FedGov Today with Francis Rose. A theoretical shift is underway at the Patent and Trademark Office. That shift is turning into real life examples now. Jamie Holcomb is the Chief Information Officer at Patent and Trademark. Jamie, welcome. Thanks for coming on the program. Define this shift that you call projects to products, Jamie. Thanks a lot, Francis. I will tell you, projects to products is a very important philosophical and objective goal setting at the Patent and Trademark Office. In essence, what we did was we actually eliminated the program management office and we put our business owners in charge of the product teams. So logically what we did was we took the four largest areas and we created a product line of each. There's patents, there's product, correction, trademarks, there's the back office business, and there's the infrastructure teams, IT shared services. Each one has about seven or eight products. Those products are led by a business owner, not a technology person. So what we have in essence is the business prioritizing the IT projects, prioritizing the product work, and making sure those priorities and trade-offs are conducted with the mission in mind, awarding patents and registering trademarks. What did you have to do from the philosophical perspective to get people to buy into a change like this, Jamie? Well, as you can well imagine, the culture is pretty permanent within, especially at a place 200 plus years at the Patent and Trademark Office. Those people are highly competent in what they do. But what I was trying to do was to get them think along different lines. In other words, you have to do the new ways of working. In essence, I gave the ability for all of our product leaders and right down to the developers to challenge the status quo and to say, well, if that's the way we did it before, isn't there a better way to do that? Isn't there a new way to work such that you could take those 10 point checklists and you could collapse them into seven or eight points and automate the other two or three points. So my challenge was to all the product teams was to make it better, cheaper and faster and that's usually a business not a government objective mostly because the uh, government is so involved with compliance and regulation we have to get back to the mission to make it not just better but cheaper and faster as well do you have advantages to do those kinds of things because pto is a fee-based agency rather than an appropriated agency or is this something that someone could do in an appropriated agency too I believe you can do it in an appropriate industry. I've been in the military, I've been in intelligence, and I've been in the foreign service. I do believe there's uh, lessons to learn from this. However, we are afforded that fee-based structure. No taxpayer money is taken. But that also means it's even more important that we show our fee payers a return on their investment. And so we try to make it as easy as possible and the fees as low as possible so that we can afford everyone the equity to apply and participate in intellectual property. That is one of our major things. A lot of people might not realize, but we charge fees as low up front as we can, and eventually we will make back the money that we put into it. Only those fee payers who are actually participating, not just the applicants, because sometimes you're re rejected. So if you're rejected, you're not going to make that up. We don't make that up unless you're paying for it in the future. Mm -hmm. um, from a tactical perspective, once you instituted this philosophical shift, what infrastructure changes, anything like that, did you have to make to deliver on this vision? Well, as you can well imagine, the reporting is a lot different because now it's very tactical. The strategy is done on a quarterly basis, which is even more crazy within the federal government. Normally, it's just yearly that you look back. But we took the commercial best practice of every quarter you have to show results to the point where if you don't show results, you adjust and adapt. And if three quarters in a row, we have the option to actually throw away that product team 
It's not that they're bad people. It's just that they're not working well together to get results. Mm -hmm. So we have an obligation to ensure we're getting results every 90 days. And I say that too because our milestones are 30, 60, and 90. Show me that you can do something. You have to get ahead. Mm -hmm. The ability to understand sunk costs within the federal government is a big deal as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say it's too big to fail. In the commercial world, there's no such thing as it's too big to fail. Yeah. You have to keep adjusting, either that or say enough's enough and do something different. What did the change management look like to get this to where it is today in your view, Jamie? So there's three aspects of everything, people, process, and tools. Mm -hmm. I'm primarily talking about the process, but the people change is what we had to do. That's the biggest change management. So we actually did have to change the organization, but I didn't do that simultaneously. What we did was a reorganization over five years, and we showed how it was beneficial with our results in the first year. Once you develop that momentum, that slow mojo as mo moving forward and getting your disciples to come along with you, mm -hmm. and it's not just faith, it's actually proven results. So everything should be based on results. Did you see a momentum where maybe in the beginning it was slow and then it picked up over time as people saw, okay, what he said was going to work is working and so we can be more confident, we can move more aggressively? Exactly so. However, what I warn folks about is you should expect failure. In fact, failure should be encouraged, but not at a large scale. You fail small and you fail fast. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, within that 90 days, you don't repeat the same mistakes in the next 90 days. So often people have great suggestions, but nothing is heard because, oh, if we just put more into it, we'll get the results. Mm -hmm. Perseverance does count, but it has to be smart. You mentioned automating some processes. How did you decide what processes made the most sense for automation? And is there a point where maybe too much automation is a thing? So one of the biggest fallacies is that the CIO knows everything and he can solve all problems. When you start pushing down your responsibilities and accountabilities, you have to give the people the budget that's required to get things done and let them solve the problems at the tactical level. I've learned in the military that colonels and generals don't really make those tactical decisions. It needs to be made by the NCOs, lieutenants and captains who are on the line fighting the battle. For you to assume that you know what to do at that front line is fallacy. You've talked about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning at PTO under kind of three categories, classification, search and fraud detection. What do those look like, each of those buckets, Jamie? Each of them look very different. On the classification side, what we can do is a very automated process. And we do have supervised learning, but it's not as intense as that supervised learning for search. In our search algorithms, we are actually including the examiners in everything we do. We take their feedback into consideration so that every loop there's learning for the individual examiner, not for the whole. In other words, it's not artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. So each examiner gets their own AI bot mm -hmm. for themselves, and it learns and understands what their preferences are, what their relative weights are. So that's another way that we prevent the resistance and gain the adoption. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that the AI is uh, the augmented piece, it sounds like what you're going for is that that person understands this is to help me, this is a tool to help me, and this is not technology that's going to take my job away. That's correct. Is that part of it? Replacement is terrible. Mm -hmm. You don't want to replace somebody. You want to free them up from the clerical and administrative duties. If you have to go out and get all this prior art and assemble it and bring it back so you can see it, that's not an examiner. An examiner is supposed to be thinking about all the different things that are presenting. And it's not just one thing that can refute it, but it's a preponderance of things that can uh, purport. So the, the whole thing about doing a Google search and finding a single object in your results, that's not what an examiner does. Mm -hmm. An examiner finds not one, but 50 different things that can refute the claim. All right, we have about a minute left, and uh, the viewer would sue me if I had a CIO on and didn't ask about zero trust. Where's, what's your zero trust journey look like at PTO, James? It's a maturity process. Yeah. I think there's way too much emphasis on the user authentication, although it's needed. You have to think about the other four pillars, especially the machine identity pillar. So we're doing a lot more in maturing along all four pillars and making sure user, application, 
data, network, and machine identity are all taken into account. All right. Uh, no lawsuit against me for malpractice, Jamie. It's great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. You can read more about all the things Jamie and I talked about on today's show page at FedGovToday.com. Up next, two big factors in your agency's cloud journey. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. Mark your calendar for December 14th. AFSIA DC invites you to the 47th annual Winter Gala at the National Building Museum. Join leaders from defense, federal IT, and the industry for an unforgettable evening of elegance and goodwill. Last year, AFSIA DC raised more than $190,000 for scholarships and collected thousands of toys, and they want to top that this year. Reserve your tickets now. Visit dc.afsiachapters.org for details or go to fedgovtoday.com slash events. Welcome back. Technologists say two factors are driving a software shift that underpins cloud migration for federal agencies. And those technologists say the multi-cloud environments agencies have adopted have complicated that shift a bit. Tricia Fitzmorris is Vice President of Sales for Rancher Government Solutions. Tricia, welcome. It's great to talk to you. Those two factors are containerization and Kubernetes. And you told me before we went on the air, they're kind of the same thing. Tell me what the differences, similarities are, and what that all means relative to what an agency wants to do in the cloud. Sure, absolutely. Agencies for the past almost decade have been looking at a migration to cloud. It started all with agencies relying on their data centers and looking at a way to gain more elasticity and clouds offer them that capability. Containers have been the catalyst for how agencies were able to move to the cloud and actually take workloads and deploy them into a containerized environment and be able to take those and make them portable across from the data center out to a cloud and then now really where they're becoming more sophisticated really determining what applications are better suited for what clouds mm -hmm. and containerization makes that portability possible kubernetes is the orchestration platform that manages that we see there have been many kubernetes platforms that are out there today now um, and so where we see agencies looking with the adoption now of not just a cloud, but multiple clouds, looking at how they are able to then manage those containerized workloads in various Kubernetes platforms across those multi-clouds. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we're seeing agencies start to move. When they come to you and on this journey that you just described, what are some of the common questions that they ask you? What are some of the kind of the common problems that those agencies have? Most of them have the problems that they have, you know, it's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. They've had multiple programs that have been ordered to multiple contractors and those contractors may have come in with a different Kubernetes orchestration platform. So they're really looking for how do I, how do I take on the need to manage and be able to gain compliance and control and be able to increase my security posture without having to, to increase any of our technical debt. So what they're looking for is the ability to incorporate something that can give them that security and that capability of management of those various clouds, but also not increase their overall cost of having to rip and replace. I mentioned that some technologists in, in, on the government side are saying the multi-cloud environment's complicating this a little bit for me. Mm -hmm. Is it the environment itself or is it the things that they're doing in these multi-cloud environments, the applications that they're running that are bouncing from cloud to cloud, or is it kind of all of the above? I don't, I don't think that clouds, that having a multi-cloud is necessarily very um, difficult, aside from the fact that you then are managing those various different clouds separately. So you really want to be able to raise that up a level and create a management platform across all of them to where you can provision containers, you can increase your security posture by creating compliance, you can enforce things that are coming out based on executive order 14028 about secure supply chain and creating SBOMs. Um, so that's really, I think, the complexity of having a multi-cloud environment is simply that you may have to manage those multi-clouds separately. What about mistakes? Have you gone into situations where agencies have maybe tried some things that haven't worked and that they wind up having to clean up afterwards? Um, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes is an acceptable answer. <laughs> yes. Um, 
But, uh, you know, mainly, no, nothing, uh, in, you know, and I tell my teams that nothing is catastrophic. And I think that in um, being a partner to the U.S. government and being able to come in and say, okay, let's look, take a look at what you have and let's take a look at what we can provide to be able to augment, enhance, um, without them having to go and say, hey, we created this big mistake and now we have to start at ground zero. I don't think mm -hmm. anything requires anybody to, to come back to ground zero. Mm -hmm. We have about a minute left. You wrote recently about the demand for edge computing and how that's changing this. What does that look like both in a defense environment and in a civilian environment? Yeah, this to me is a really exciting space because we've been relying in government on data centers and leveraging uh, data and workloads in a cloud, but now we're looking at the advancement of technology and being able to to deploy workloads based on container, being able to provide lightweight Kubernetes uh, platforms out there at the edge on small form factor equipment. And so now we're able to take that and be able to, to take workloads and process data directly where mission is happening. And that's hugely important in the global turbulent situations that we may have where you want the ability to give a end user the ability to make a decision immediately without having to wait on data latency, especially if they're going out and deploying in areas of no comm and low comms. And that's really across the board. That's not just military, that's US uh, citizens as well in the, U or in the US government today and where they deploy, whether it's an airport or they're at the border, there's a need for processing data immediately, quickly, and being able to perform mission as fast as possible. Trish, it's great insight. Thanks very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. You can read more about all those topics on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. Up next, a new TMF investment at the Labor Department. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. Joe Baptiste, Senior Manager for Technology Consulting at EY from AI In Depth. So when you think about a process map, you think about a, th a three level process map, well automations really need to go down to the fifth level, the keystrokes, mm -hmm. right? What are you looking at when you're looking at this Excel file? What is, the, what is the AI going to interpret when it looks at this data? And how is it interpreting it? Is it interpreting it uh, based, based on bias, right? So then we gotta be truthful. You know, how, do we, how do we make the truth come out of it? To watch the whole program, go to fedgovtoday.com slash AI. Welcome back. The newest award from the Technology Modernization Fund is going to the Labor Department. That agency will establish an online registry to help citizens find lost retirement savings and benefits. Mangala Kupa is Director of Business Application Services at the Labor Department. Mangala, welcome. It's great to see you. Take me to the back to the beginning of this. How did you and your colleagues at Labor determine this was something, number one, you wanted to do, number two, that you wanted to apply to the TMF board for money to do? Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, before I answer that, I want to talk a little bit about the department's mission because this is um, a core uh, uh, capability of the mission itself. So we have a diverse mission, 27 agencies. We are uh, helping military transition to civilian lives. We are securing mines for workers. We are ensuring 401k, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, the mission is vast and affects every aspect of labor workforce. So for us, um, it, it, we have over 500 systems we manage and we're constantly building new capabilities. This particular area deals with securing your 401k. And the problem is that there is benefits unclaimed in the system in the neighborhood of billions, right? And EBSA, which is one of the agencies, tries to track down people who haven't claimed their benefits and actually provide them those funds. And sometimes we are tracking them in homeless shelters, right? So you can understand the impact this particular tool would provide. So we had a very good need for it. Um, there is also a mandate, congressional mandate, to try and build the system. So the next step for us was to figure out how to fund it because Department of Labor mostly is a flat funded organization. So we always compete with different priorities and the funding. And TMF has been instrumental for the department 
in um, securing funding not just for this particular project. This is our third mission application that is funded by the TMF. I'm very proud of that. This is our fifth award from TMF. So we, um, we are very aware of this opportunity that is av made available. And we made a case to the TMF board that this is worth funding. Uh, and they have bought into the value it would provide to, to the American public. Uh, and so we, we had to go through the process of you know uh, submitting a, a proposal. Uh, it starts with an initial proposal where you're trying to outline the value that it brings. And then you work with the board and the PMO, the GSA PMO, and work through the process of elaborating on the business case. And when TMF likes your business case, they're going to try and fund it if they can. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we went about actually looking for this uh, this award. What are the business cases that you have found to be successful? What Are, are there common elements among the, the projects that you've done through the board? I, I think so. I think, you know, board has parameters of impact to the public, for example. Is it in in increasing your cyber posture? Uh, so it's really about mission and value. Um, you may be aware that with the Department of Labor, we were given the temporary labor certification award uh, flag. Uh, I think it, it was in back in 2018. Last year, we went to them and asked for funds for permanent labor certification processing, which, which we'll be finishing this year. So the common thread is really trying to help American public, mm -hmm. right? And, and increase the cybersecurity posture, uh, focus on customer experience, Right, making it easy to tap into government benefits, for example. In this case, um, the work that EBSA does is behind the scene, right? They're trying to track down unclaimed benefits in the system and track you down if you were to be the recipient, right? But this tool will make it available to you to log in yourself and see if you have any you know, unclaimed benefits because we all change our jobs all the time. Sometimes maybe we left a 4G on case somewhere and it's sitting in unclaimed, lost and found database space. So th we're very excited about this. I, uh, we hope to bring to bear by end of this uh, calendar year mm -hmm. in 2024. And, and I'm very um, you know, happy about this particular award. <laughs> you anticipated my question is, what's the timeline look like for getting this up and running, getting it tested, or whatever the steps are that you're going to take to deliver it? We are hoping to um, you know, complete this in the calendar year 24. Uh, of course, as you know, um, big bang approaches don't work. So we want to get our first version out there and, and keep building on that to increase the customer experience for, for the American public. Mm -hmm. When you do take on a project like this or any of the others, you told me before we went on the air that you have a, just a ton of projects underway. Um, when you take one of these on, how do you plot out that iterative process? Uh, the one advantage, I guess, to a, a waterfall is that you know what the end state's going to be. We've also learned over time that most people never reach that. So how do you build the little pieces on the, in the interim to make sure that you're staying on track? So it does take some front-end planning. Uh, I think the key is to partner with your customer, um, the agencies, build a trusted relationship, have some sort of a product management concept going, Right, work with them to figure out how fast can you build something of value, right? So we call it minimum viable product, mm -hmm. right? So you're going to work with your customers, your product owners, or your product management crew, which comes from your customer agency, a representation from users, you know, and you want to work with them and build a roadmap. What we do at the department with all our new projects is there is a technique in agile development which we call it story mapping. So we work with our customers and say, okay, what capabilities are highest priority to get out of the door so that you have early return on investment. So we build that roadmap. We try to build it one MVP at a time, minimum viable product. Uh, the idea is that time to market is going to be faster, right? You want, for example, if this database goes out there, someone can log in and actually start getting information about that, right? And then if we want to build more capabilities down the line, we can certainly do that. So we tend to work with our partners, our, our agency customers, and build a roadmap that gives us some guidelines. And, and you have to do some of that work early on. Um, even when we go through the team of process, they usually prefer a well-baked proposal, mm -hmm. right? So something that where we have done some legwork to figure out what our roadmap, roadmap looks like, how we're going to increment over the time, how we're going to incorporate customer experience into the process. So all of that we do as a standard practice, I think, which puts us in a better place to succeed with these projects. Are there elements of those roadmaps that you can use from project to project, or do that does, does the different nature 
nature of the different outcomes that you're going for require you to start each one over again? That's such an important question, Francis. I think um, if you ask different customers, is this the same system as something else I'm building? The answer is pretty much going to be probably not. But that doesn't mean there's no commonality behind. Um, I spent a good decade of my career being a technical person, and I can tell you, once you start building the systems, there's a lot more commonalities behind the scene. So what we have done at the, at the department is that we built a central team that does a detailed solutioning for any new system. And, and the advantage to that approach is that they become knowledgeable and aware of all of the mission systems. Um, about four and a half years ago, we went through a process called shared services. So what it did is to bring all the mission system support into under OCIO, right? And that gives uh, me the opportunity to look at all different business systems we are building. So the central team looks through and tries to identify commonalities. We have um, taken nine grant making agencies in the department and moved them to one single grant system, for example, right? We have built tools, for example, address standardization, right? The data quality oriented tools that are used across mission systems. We have consolidated platforms, right? We have consolidated licenses so that you have a better leverage to get a better pricing. Um, there is a lot we have done, and there's a lot that we gain because of the central view of shared services, which benefits us tremendously. Mangala, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you, Javi. You can read more about the new TMF award and more about the Labor Department's IT operations on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. FedGov Today continues in a moment. Mark your calendar for December 14th. AFSIA DC invites you to the 47th annual Winter Gala at the National Building Museum. Join leaders from defense, federal IT, and the industry for an unforgettable evening of elegance and goodwill. Last year, AFSIA DC raised more than $190,000 for scholarships and collected thousands of toys, and they want to top that this year. Reserve your tickets now. Visit dc.afsiachapters.org for details or go to fedgovtoday.com slash events. Welcome back in today's event spotlight. AFSIA DC's 47th annual Winter Gala is coming December 14th at the National Building Museum. It'll have a Swan Lake theme this year. Senior level civilian and uniformed DOD leaders, federal IT decision makers, and GovTech industry executives will be there. Proceeds benefit AFSIA DC scholarship and STEM programs. If you want to be there too, you can find the link to read more and buy tickets at fedgovtoday.com slash events. FedGov Today TV returns next Sunday morning at 1030 with the Chief Information Officer of the Air Force, Venus Goodwine, in her first interview since she became CIO and the Chief Information Officer of the United States, Claire Martirana. I'm Francis Rose. I'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for watching. Have a great week. Mark your calendar for December 14th. AFSIA DC invites you to the 47th annual Winter Gala at the National Building Museum. Join leaders from defense, federal IT, and the industry for an unforgettable evening of elegance and goodwill. Last year, AFSIA DC raised more than $190,000 for scholarships and collected thousands of toys, and they want to top that this year. Reserve your tickets now. Visit dc.afsiachapters.org for details or go to fedgovtoday.com events.